Alec Pierce Scuba, right there on my chest. You can see it. And guess what? I'm the talent. <laughs> I get such a kick out of these shirts. Actually, Kevin's dear wife, Joanne, made these shirts as a birthday present for Kevin. And she made these fantastic uh, uh, Alec Pierce Scuba shirts for us. <laughs> I think it was the talent. Anyway, we're here to talk about something very serious because it's a little while ago. We had a vintage scuba topic. It was called Diver training, old versus new, which is best? Great topic. Great topic. And the reason I say it was a great topic is because I got hundreds, <laughs> if not thousands, of comments on it. Yeah, that's how I know it's a great topic. Okay. 90%, nah, 80% of the comments were positive, meaning that the people felt, as I did, and expressed that. New training is better, puts out better divers. Better, but better divers than the old training. In the old days, in the 50s and 60s, I was trained in 1960. In the old days, in the 50s and 60s, the diver training was an obstacle course. It was an elimination process, basically what it amounted to. All the instructors <clears throat> were Navy uh, divers. My instructor was an ex-Navy diver. He did the part. He looked the part too. Oh, like this. Big brush cut. Talk like this. All right. <laughs> and the books, the textbooks of the day were written by Navy divers. The most experienced divers in the world. Yeah, they were. They were the only divers in the world. But they were Navy divers. <laughs> they weren't recreational divers. They didn't do it for fun. They went down in hard hat and other gear vertically sat on the edge of a shipwreck and fixed things. That's not what we do. So their training methods, while certainly dynamic, it's a pretty fair word, were not good training techniques for recreational divers. Okay? And I've talked about this and that. Really look, look back and you'll find it. Diver training. Good enough. So anyway, I pulled this. I've got so many comments, I thought I'd better do another one. I better have a follow-up, if you like, to diver training. Old versus new. So that's what this one is. And what do we call this one, Kevin? This is uh, things you should not learn. Okay? So you took your training program more than 20 years ago. You learned a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff. Yeah. You should not have learned some of that stuff. Yeah. Now, that's by today's standards. At that time, when you took the course, that's the way the courses were. I trained that way, too. I said numerous times on my, uh, in my comments that I'm embarrassed. I, I am embarrassed about the number of divers who came to me in the hopes of being a frogman, as I did when I was 12 years old. And I dashed their hopes. I said to them, nope, nope, you can't do this, you can't be a frogman, goodbye. I'm embarrassed about that. But anyway, let me carry on, let me say, what, let me explain. This is my textbook. Now you've seen this book before, The New Science of Skin and Scuba Diving. Meaning this is a new version of the old book that was written 12 to 15 years earlier by these wonderful group of ex-Navy divers. Okay. This is mine. This is actually mine. Mine, 60 years ago. You see what it says right there? It says A.C. Pierce, Lindsay, Ontario. Written in a very childish writing as a 10 or 12 year old would write his name. A.C. Pierce. I put my initials only because I thought it was cool. You know, A.C. Pierce. At Lindsay and Dare. This is actually my textbook from back then. This is one. This is the one we used. Okay. You'll notice a couple of things right off the front cover. The guy's wearing an old-fashioned oval mask. Probably a single seal, one strap. He's also using a two-hose regulator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because of course that's what we were using. I was trained on two hose. I dove for two hose on, on two hose for several years. So this is a genuine vintage textbook. It's called it old textbook. Let's see what's in it, okay? Here's the stuff you learned. Now, I'm not going to deal with the academics, okay? The fact that it goes through, talks about compressors, and how you clean air, and spear fishing, and how you service your regulator, and how all the different types of regulators work. I'm not going to go through all of that. We've already dealt with that a little bit, and that, that is something that you don't need to learn today, any more than you need to learn how to fix your, your limited slip differential on your car, or that you need to explain the principle of a constant velocity joint. Every car has them. You didn't even know that, maybe. You certainly probably don't know how they work, much less how to fix them. But you're a great driver, right? Kind of the same principle. 
Anyway, let's not, I don't want to deal with academics. I want to deal with skills, things that you should not have learned. Now, here's one right off the bat. Here's a picture of a diver. Now, as it happens, this is a skin diver, but the same principle, the same, the same, uh, the same skill, if you like, uh, uh, applies for both. And here's a picture of a skin diver. Uh, it happens to have a spear gun, but that's, that's the way it was in those days. Here's a top picture of a good guy coming up, and he's summing up from the bottom, and he's been skin diving, been holding his breath. He's probably in a hurry. Whether he's holding his breath or if he's on skew, but really it doesn't affect the skill. And he's coming up. How is he coming up? He's looking up. It's always smart to look in the direction you're, you're, you're moving, whether you're driving a car or scuba diving. And secondly, he's got his hand up over his head. Your head is your most vulnerable part. You don't, you don't want to hurt your head. You've got to protect your head at all times, okay? So you put your hand up over your head and your circle as you come towards the surface, watching the surface. That is a standard skill that you'll learn in every scuba diving course. And you know what? That's a good skill. 60 years ago, it's a good skill. They had this other cute little cartoon down here about this dummy. I guess this guy's not going to be a frogman. <laughs> not looking up, not head up, and hitting the bottom of the boat. Got to hurt. <clears throat> Wooden boat. But anyway, so this is a good skill. Let's see what else is in here. A couple pages farther on. I marked these pages. I went through this book a little earlier. I marked these pages. And let's go on to the next skill that's in here. And the next skill <clears throat> is simple, very simple, very important skill that uh, we learned, I learned. Very important skill. And this is how to roll as you clear your mouthpieces and your two hose regulator. That's a really important skill. And we practice this because if you don't know this, with a two hose regulator, in many cases, did not have non return valves. So the, those two big hoses, those two wonderful big hoses that Rob and all my buddies like when they dive two hose, <laughs> sorry, Rob, they fill with water. Those two hoses probably hold half a gallon, two or three liters of water. If you want to clear that regulator, you have two choices. You swallow all that water. Ain't going to happen. Or somehow you get the air in the regulator to blow that water out. In order to do that with the two hose, you roll. You have to learn how to do it. Pretty good skill, right? No. You don't need that skill. It doesn't apply anymore to single host regulators. Now here's another method over here, another skill over here. This is how to recover your two host regulator. Pull it down, back in your mouth and clear it. That right? No, not gonna happen. You probably don't know this, or maybe you do, that if a two host regulator mouthpiece comes out of your mouth, it goes up, it goes up in the air. With your single hose regulator you use, if it pops out of your mouth, it falls down here. And you know you have recovery methods. You dip your shoulder, you reach like this, you pull it around and put it back in your mouth. whoop de do. With a two-hose regulator, it goes up in the air, and you can't reach the darn thing. It's bubbling like mad, wasting air. So that was a good skill back then. Today, no. There's another skill that, that you may have learned and, and uh, you, you should not have learned. Certainly not today. Okay? Here we go again. Here's another one. What are these guys? Buddy breathing. Buddy breathing. Yes, the old bugaboo. Everybody says buddy breathing is a good skill. Boy, we learn how to buddy breathe with no masks on. We swam around the pool with no masks on for 10 minutes. And then we switched sides without coming to the surface. And we swam upside down on the left side. I don't know. I heard this. Oh, 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 about buddy breathing. Oh, it's a great skill. No, buddy breathing is not a good skill. No more than sharing your parachute with your fellow uh, 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 skydiver is a good skill. No, they don't teach that in skydiving, how to give your parachute to your buddy. No, they don't do that. The regulator in your mouth is your life. That's just keeping you alive. Think about that for a while. I'll just wait a minute. Think about that. Okay, long enough. No reg in your mouth, you're, you're at risk. That's right. Why would you ever take your regulator out of your mouth? No more than taking your parachute off. You don't take your reg out of your mouth. If you're buddy breathing, you have to. True buddy breathing is, is not using an octopus, by the way, for you newer divers. It's buddy breathing, you take your rake and you give it to your buddy. And hope he's calm and cool and collected. Which he isn't because he ran out of air. He's an idiot. And you're going to give your rake to him. Anyway, you know, buddy breathing is a no-no. You -no. say, well, that doesn't hurt to learn. It does hurt to learn buddy breathing. For two reasons. First of all, it's a skill that you don't need, raises anxiety, and puts your life at risk. That's one reason. And that's, you know, pretty straightforward. There's another reason that people don't think about. When you learn how to buddy breathe, subconsciously, you now think about your buddy's primary in his mouth as a source of air in an, emer in an emergency. Think about that. 
When you learn to body breathe, you now think, subconsciously perhaps, or picture, whatever, that your body's primary regulator is a source of air. It is not a source of air. Not for you. It's a source of air for him, not for you. His octopus is a source of air for you. The octopus is a regulator sitting right here, not in his mouth, brightly colored, on a special clip, on a nice long hose. All you need to do is grab it and stick it in your mouth. As opposed to his primary, you got to go over, you got to grab it. Hopefully, he's not hanging on to you. You got to pull out his mouth. You know, I've seen, I've seen the mouthpiece get yanked up because the primary diver is holding on to his right pretty tightly. You yank it out, and the mouthpiece comes off. Now, neither one of you have any air. You got to yank it out, you stick it in your mouth, and now you're jammed up because the hose is about this long. He's biting the air, and on it goes. No, 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 no. The octopus, nice big second stage hanging right here, brightly colored, long hose. Grab it, stick it in your mouth. That's what you do in an out of air emergency. You do not body breathe. And if you teach body breathing, a high anxiety, high risk activity skill, you subconsciously implant the idea that, oh, I can grab my body's primary. Now here's an octopus sitting right there four inches away and you grab his primary. No, no. Understand? That's why I'm so adamant about not teaching body breathing anymore. Think about it. Think about it. I'm not always right, but I'm right this time. <laughs> Thinking about it, think about it. Okay, over here, here's a good one. Here's a good one. Here's a skill that you should all learn, right? Right? How to don your scuba unit if it's a full face mask unit. All right, we'll skip that page. We don't use them anymore. There's a skill that if you did learn it, you shouldn't have. I didn't. We didn't use full face scuba in the old days. We used a good old US diver's Mistral. Mistral double hose. You know the one? That one, yeah, yeah, you've, you've seen that one before. Yeah. <laughs> okay, here we go. This is a good one. How to put the scuba gear on over your head. Maybe if you watch some old movies, if you watch Sea Hunt a few times, or you've seen some old divers and they put the scuba unit on over their head, they reach down and pick the tank up on a boat. Yeah, boat on water. Water moves, boat moves, you know. You do that out with their headlight, and then the strap gets caught, and they wiggle it on. Oh, you're not gonna find it. And then the regulator. <laughs> You do not put your scuba unit on over your head. In the old days, when we had just a tank, just a tank and three straps, it could be done in relative safety. Arm through both straps, up over your head, slide down, drew up the waist. It could be done in relative safety. Not today, not with BCDs, and we're not going to give up BCDs. BCDs are one of the greatest safety inventions ever made. For scuba divers, right behind octopuses. But today, BCDs, they're all floppy and flexible, and they got a cummerbund with those big Velcro things that get jammed up, and they got shoulder straps with clips and hangers on, and you can't get your arm down inside far enough, you lift it halfway up, and the octopus and the gauge, oh no, you do not put your tank on over your head. So there's a skill, if you learned it, and you probably did, if you uh, took the scuba course 20 uh, years or more ago. You probably learn. You should not have learned that skill. All I got in here. Oh yeah, my favorite. Switching gear underwater. Oh boy, oh boy. We used to have so much fun with this. In this particular skill, two divers, scuba divers, fully outfitted, go to the bottom of the pool, and they switch gear. Yeah, they trade masks. They trade fins. They trade weight belts. And they trade scuba units. Yeah. So Kevin and I are at the bottom. We trade masks. They'll fit. We trade fins. I'm size nine and a half. Kevin's 11. 13. 13. 13. Okay. We trade weight belts. My weight belt is 34 inches long. His is 52. <laughs> we trade scuba units. Not going to happen. No. A silly, silly exercise. Really silly. The only ones that are sillier are a couple of other ones I want to mention because you may remember the terms if you were a, a Nawi certified diver, and that's just fine. I am a Nawi instructor, have been since 1975. Great organization. It was, it's not what it used to be, but it was a great organization. Wonderful people, good instructors. They had an exercise called the Nawi Dauphin Dawn. Nawi Dauphin Dawn. It was so famous that they had their own name board. Yeah. Then all the way off and down, you're on the bottom on your scuba unit by yourself, you see. 
solo diving. <laughs> anyway, you're on the bottom by yourself with your scuba unit. <clears throat> what do you do? Well, you take it off. You take it off here. You take your scuba unit off and you set it on the bottom. You take your fins off and you set it down there. You take your mask off and you set it down there. You take your weight belt off and you set it on top to hold it all down. And you get your rig out of your mouth and you put it down there and then you go to the surface. Now there's a skill that you can really use. You now we dock and down. Take all your gear off. Swim to the surface. Right away, you have no rag in your mouth, you have no source of air, and you're swimming to the surface with nothing in your mouth. Now, during that exercise, we do learn that you should be exhaling slightly as you, as you uh, go to the surface, and you all know why. So that's good. So you get to the surface. You get through that. You get to the surface. Now, the dawn part. Ah, you take a big breath of air. <gasps> you hyperventilate, which is a no-no. And you dive back down to the bottom of the pool. And we did this in the Olympium here in Toronto, 16 feet deep. You dive back down to the bottom of the pool, and you put it all back on. Yeah. You put your fins on, and your weight belt, your mask, and finally you get to your scuba tank, and you put the rag in your mouth and breathe and put the tank on. No, <laughs> that's not the way it works. First of all, it's high anxiety. Even though you're holding your breath, your, your heart's going boom, 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 like this. So why did they do it? Well, the theory back then was Navy, military. If you can get through this, you can be a frogman. We'll make you a frogman no matter how wimpy you are. <laughs> that, was, that was the philosophy, you see. So they had all these exercises that were actually quite difficult, some of them. The sport of scuba diving is safer than it's ever been, even though I have millions of participants. And most of those participants took a modern course. Think about all that. Anyway, there you go. More comments coming, I'm sure that. Keep them coming. I really enjoy them. And we'll talk some more about diver training as it used to be and as it is today. Take care, guys. Talk to you soon. Alec Pierce Scuba, Vintage Diving.